Hello everyone. Is this any better? Good afternoon. Something no one yet has yet had a chance to say to this group yet. Um, How is everyone doing? <laughs> Good to know. Um, just before I get started, I think they are fixing the deck anyway. Just want to get a quick sense of the room. How many people here are students? How many people here are full-time working professionals in roles with tech? How many people with in tech, semi-tech, but not roles which are necessarily full-time tech? Got it. Anything else that I'm not yet covered in the room just to understand? Somebody else with any other background, any other interest? Entrepreneurs, interesting, very cool, good to know. Thank you. Cool. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nidhi Anarkat. Um, I'm a co-founder and CEO at Navgurukul. Uh, we are talking about FOSS here, uh, free and open source software. I want to take a minute to take a step back from just the software aspect of it, but free and open source in general. That has been a huge uh, inspiration for us in everything that we build at Navgurukul. Um, so before I talk more about what that means, let me explain what we do at Navgurukul. There is a bit of context that will be helpful. Imagine a girl who has grown up in Kishanganj in Bihar. Um, father is a rickshaw puller, mother is a domestic cook, and uh, she goes to government school, and until the end of her 10th standard, she's not imagined the world outside Kishanganj too much. Somehow, within 15 months of that, she ends up finding herself working at a tech MNC just within 15 months, um, earning a little bit more than 25 to 30,000 per month, and having a career which seems like there'll be enough growth in tech month on month. Um, this is exactly what we facilitate at Navgurukul. Um, there is a student called Kajal, who is from Kishan Ganj, whose father is a rickshaw puller and mother is a domestic um, cook, who we have facilitated this for. Navgurukul essentially um, works at the problem in the problem statement is that how do we create access to tech careers for people coming from underserved and marginalized communities who usually don't have access to these careers, especially women. Um, in the world of tech, everybody who is sitting here knows uh, that the percentage of female colleagues, both in colleges as well as in working spaces, tends to be less than 10%. Even 10% is an inflated number. Men suffer from this for a variety of reasons. Women suffer of this for an obvious reason. Um, and how do we solve for this is something that we are working on. Um, Kajal is not the only person who we have done this for. We have placed more than 650 plus students in technology companies, in um, entry level software developer roles. Um, these are students who may not even have finished engineering or let alone any degree, but they have the skill sets that are required to work in software development, front end, back end engineering kind of roles, and that's, that's what we facilitate. Essentially, first, before we're looking at how do we facilitate this, understanding the problem in higher education uh, in India a little bit. Usually, affordability is a problem if we talk about the communities that we are talking about. How many people here have studied in government schools? A small percentage, understandably so, but still a decent percentage to see. How many people here have uh, studied in a non-English medium, vernacular medium school as a part of their? Good to see this group. Um, so then, I mean, this group can then relate to the challenges that I'm talking about. Um, first of all, affordability is a problem for a lot of the world, even still, India has done a good job of creating access, increasing access to higher education, especially since 2006. Since the last 17 years, we have increased higher education colleges by a huge percentage. At 2006, our gross enrollment ratio was at 15%. Today, it is at 28%. At India's scale, that is a huge number. But even then, the colleges tend to be either access, access lack of affordability is there, lack of access is there, formal education is there. Language tends to be a problem more often than not. Pedagogy tends to be a problem. Classroom learning doesn't work for everyone. So all of these problems combined, if you think about, for example, a girl from a scheduled tribe in Maharashtra, she might not finish 10th standard or 12th standard to go to college. Even if she finishes 
10th or 12th standard, having money to be able to go to college or having a social situation at home that allows her to go to college, which is farther away, might be a problem. Somehow she crosses both of these, all of these economic, social, uh, finishing college access barriers and reaches a college. There's no guarantee that if she finishes the college, she will get a relevant job that will make her uh, do the upward social mobility. Um, because learning in colleges can be outdated curriculum, language becomes a barrier again, cultural shift becomes a barrier again, and that's the problem that Navgurukul solves for. We do three different things in order to solve uh, for this same problem statement in different ways. The first thing is residential campuses, which is a physical in-person learning centers. I'll speak a lot more about it. Second is Miraki, which is our online digital learning app. And third is something called Samyath, which is a tech cooperative of sorts. And I'll speak more about all three of these things. In all of these things, everything that we do is open source, not just the code that we write. There is a bunch of different code that we write for solving specific problems in all of these things. But everything that we do, our playbook, is completely open source. And we would actually love if more people want to pick it up and do and replicate what we are doing, or change it and do it in a better way or in a different way. So first is residential centers. Navgurukul started with this, up, this program. This is our flagship uh, center. The idea is very simple. Um, can we help people learn programming? And because programming is a signalable skill, can we make sure they get access to programming jobs, even if they may not have the relevant degrees? Um, because people can test for skills as opposed to just testing for the degrees. Because anyway, we all know, I mean, degrees mean nothing. You could have gone to the best college and yet not have the skills, and you could have never have stepped foot in a college and yet have the skills. Um, so that's what we do. The program is a 15-month long, self-paced, peer-led program where students stay on our campuses, learn programming from the very basic, they start from basic math. Students. The basic eligibility criteria is just 10th standard, and the test that we take is for 6th and 8th standard English and algebra. And from there on, we work with them. And within 15 months, in a very practical curriculum, by having a learning pedagogy that is super effective, by making ensuring that students are working hard, by tracking their effort and inputs rather than outputs, we create a whole learning system. There's a peer-based learning system where students stay on campuses. It's completely free for them. They don't have to pay a single penny for this program. It's a Navgurukul is a not-for-profit, which raises its funds through CSRs. And we today have, we started in late 2016. Up until March 2020, we were a small organization with just five people team, two campuses, 88 students. In the last three years, we have scaled up to having a capacity of about 1,300 students across India in our physical campuses. Uh, Ten of these campuses across India Five campuses are actually in partnerships with governments, district collectors or universities like Delhi Skills and Entrepreneurship University, where our campuses are housed. Infrastructure is provided by government. Mobilization is helps to government or these universities help us reach out to the right deserving audience and students for these. And we take care of what we know how to do best, which is learning and placements. So that's Navgurukul Residential Centers. A little bit more. What works, what is a unique innovation, is the pedagogy. It's a unique best of both worlds. There is a lot of uh, support through social, emotional, peer learning, grounding that is happening. But students are also learning on their own. If you do pure online learning, um, the completion rates in online learning are very low. All of us have tried to learn online and some or the other MOOC in some ways. But we don't always end up finishing because we don't have the other support system and infrastructure that is needed. But so we do physical learning, but not classrooms to ensure that students learn to learn how learning actually happens in industry. Those of us who are working, we don't sit down and be like, oh, someone has to do a classroom for us to learn the new, like we were working on React, and now Vue is around. So somebody has to sit down and teach us Vue. We learn to learn on our own. So we ensure that that's the pedagogy that we do. And because of that, within 15 months, students are able to actually learn and retain and actually have practical skills that they can apply in the industry. I can speak more about this if needed. I want to stay focused on the software aspect, just setting up the context. So moving faster from this. In terms of residential, in order to run the residential program, we are building data systems as well as learning systems, which are very innovative. The learning system is we are building ground up on Moodle, which is an open source uh, LMS software. And we are doing things there innovatively, like, like thinking about tracking students' input. Has the student put in 9 to 10 hours of hard work on a daily basis? 
uh, rather than output because output only track it, tracks privilege. If someone, some student is just doing learning faster, that doesn't mean anything for us. How much hard work is a student doing? And if they are not doing an intervention based on, are you putting in your effort? As long as you put in your effort, one day you will learn and progress and that's fine and we don't necessarily try to um, have a very like you have to finish this by this timeline because each student will learn at their own pace. In the learning literature, it's, there's a lot of proof and research which talks about it doesn't make sense to some students have, for example, in our first few modules take many more months than other students, but they take so much time and they do their groundwork and the basics um, so strongly that in the later modules they end up doing much faster. So we track and we, are, we have systems to track all of these things in the Moodle software that we are doing where we collect energies, there's some innovation, gamification that we are doing to be able to make learning visible, measurable, bite-sized, fun for our learners and track input. So this Moodle thing is uh, open source and if somebody wants to pick it up, we are still building it, it's very new, but if somebody, and it's, it, there is an old version that we have, but the new version has this input tracking as a philosophy and people can pick it up. Um, we are also building a data systems of sorts. Um, when you do learning which is self-paced, week by week, how do we know if students are making progress? How do we know if students are attending classrooms? Because classrooms are not classrooms. They sit in a room and work on their own. How do we know whether they are learning or not? How much is attendance? And so on and so forth. So there's a whole data systems of sorts that we are building on top of Zoho. Now Zoho is not fully open source, but all of our code and everything that we will we are working on it will be fully open source. So anybody wants to click and create an instance of a campus or a school or a college of their own to have what all modules will go in order to track what kind of tracking all of that is visible and is open source and anybody can pick it up. Um, we've done placements, we've placed more than 60, 650 plus students in all of these um, organizations, NatWest, Microsoft, NatWest, Accenture, um, small IT services and product companies, many have hired from us, 120 plus companies have hired students from Navgurukul who continue to stay in their organizations. Retention tends to be a lot better with Navgurukul students. Um, ability to learn, more humble, comes from comes at a different price point than your usual engineers would come at. So that's, that's very quickly about placements. The, as we were doing Navgurukul, at some point Maharashtra government, tribal welfare department saw the work that we do and they said that can we get 4,200 students in a certain tribal belt from Maharashtra to take the screening test to appear at, to be able to come at Navgurukul campus. Out of those 4,200, and our screening test is very simple, 6th standard English, 8th standard algebra and that's it. And it's a cutoff. It's not like IITs by default, by design, we don't want to serve the top. We want to serve people who are able to uh, clear the basic uh, margin so that we can be sure that we can get them jobs within 15 months. Out of those 4,200 students, about 100 students were able to clear our test, just 100. And out of those, only 30 were actually able to make it to our campuses for a variety of reasons. Family not permitting, girls, this is too good to be true. Who keeps a girl? for 15 months, for free, no food, no stay, nothing, and so on and so forth. So families, at that time, we were still young now, there's a still bit of a um, brand recognition that happens, but that still happens because parents don't know us. The world, you folks know us. Students' parents may not know us. And hence, uh, only 30 students ended up coming on campuses. And we realized how we all think that in the world of internet information asymmetry doesn't exist, but it does. A lot of students going to government schools never know what uh, careers in IT look like, um, how to access those careers, um, what do you need to do in order to access those careers, and a lot of these information asymmetry exists, out of which Miraki was born. Miraki is actually primarily built, the idea completely started by our alumni. Um, even in residential systems, we hire our alumni a lot more, 60% of our team in residential is our alumni. Some of the students as well as team are present here today. Um, if you can just raise your hands. Um, um. Thank you. Kanjana is an alumni who is now a part of the team as well. Um, and so residential systems are actually, residential program is run by alumni quite a bit as well. And Miraki as an idea started by an alumni who wanted to work on Android as something that she wanted to learn. And she proposed that can we create an app um, web-based, um, uh, mobile-first app, which is, uh, which is just a collection of a bunch of learning resources and so on and so forth. Initially, we thought what would be the use case of it, but when we saw the 4,200 Maharashtra students who were not able to come to it, we started working with governments very closely. Today, Miraki is being used by, has been used by 65,000 plus students in government schools. Even teacher training we do with government 
teach trainings, teachers training we do, which we have trained more than 1,000 plus students, and 65,000 plus students have learned use from Miraki. The teacher training is an extensive five day long training where we do, it is aligned with NAP, where we train people on introduction to Python, touch typing, scratch, etc. The core innovation that we've done in Miraki is actually just by using this phone and connecting with a keyboard, which is just 150 rupees, you can actually learn touch typing. You can, our uh, Miraki uh, app has a compiler in Python within the phone, so you don't need access to a computer in order to be able to start learning programming. All of this is actually offline, works in offline mode because we can't take internet as a granted even today. Hopefully in the next few months uh, with the uh, recent announcement that Reliance has made on the uh, on the go internet, that problem will fundamentally get solved. But even today, you don't have access to internet in classrooms always. So this app actually works completely offline. Um, you can actually compile a piece of code in Python in phone and save that like desktop. You can save your files and use that. Similarly, Scratch, you can use completely offline, which have in, we have Indianized sprints. We have Indianized a version of Scratch, which makes it much more accessible for students. And uh, touch typing with the use of keyboard, you can actually use touch typing. So removing barriers to early barriers of like basic things, introduction to English, introduction to touch typing, introduction to Python, until functions just understanding the fundamentals of programming, and Scratch are all accessible within Miraki, our app. And people can learn it async as well. And on top of it, we provide classrooms, which are digital online classrooms that they can become a part of and learn from. And the batches are ongoing. And they can learn on their own and also kind of sign up for a batch of classrooms that are going on, which digital ER trainers conduct on a regular, ongoing basis. So that's Miraki for you. I will quickly show a video that just looks, looks through it. I definitely um, didn't have enough time to go it more in detail. But if you can see this video very quickly. It's a mobile first app, but you have the whole thing available on web as well, um, just as is. And uh, the whole uh, library is github.navgurukul, the whole repository is available. Anybody wants to do it. I don't know if the video will load. We can wait. I can pause here if some, I have a couple of things to talk about, but until the video loads, if somebody has a question, I'm happy to take questions. No questions? Yes. Can you talk us through the composition of your team? How do you support these students? Yes. Um, so this is team, that slide is there. Let this load. Um, essentially, Navgurukul started by an IIT Delhi. I have myself, a uh, comp science graduate. I've studied at Harvard. And uh, people who are comp science enthusiasts got, start, got this started. The philosophy is actually, so a lot of team members, Coach Chef, uh, if you know Coach Chef, the person who actually started Coach Chef within Direct Eye, someone who works full time with us, Anup Kalbalia, and uh, multiple there, someone who has worked 25 years at Microsoft, um, is now full time at Navgurukul. Similar, few profiles like that, who work at Navgurukul full time, who are hosting different aspects, the CTO aspect, the academic aspect, what learning should be, how we break it down. And there are people who have a lot of background in learning experience design and pedagogy who are taking all that curriculum and how do we make it bite-sized, accessible, and so on and so forth. So that's the central team that talks about. In each campus, you would have a program manager and associates who take care of different aspects of learning, culture, ensuring that the campus is, the environment is conducible, and so on and so forth. Overall, 70% of our team is women. It might not load. Okay. Moving on from that, then. Thank you. I can share this video, and Miraki app is available, and people can go ahead and kind of like it's on just on Android. Um, but to answer your question, 70% of our team is women, 60% of our team is our alumni, um, and then we hire people from outside Navgurukul as well, and it's a combination, they serve the campuses, which are very self. It's the focus shifts from teaching to learning. So the people who are working on campuses are not called teachers, they are facilitators. So there's a fundamental shift in how learning happens, and happy to speak more. There's a lot of org rethinking that is required in order to do this stuff. So we can speak more to that. Uh, can Miraki support uh, local languages also? Actually, it does. I forgot to speak about it. We already have a lot. All of the content is available in Hindi, and we are building content. So there is a new within work Miraki we are doing in partnership with Amazon. Miraki is fully funded by Amazon, actually. Okay. And uh, in partnership with Amazon, we are building a code for C for CA, code for climate action. There's going to be hackathons within government schools, and we are building content and um, sort of understanding, sort of set up content and how they can actually 
create solutions for climate action using Scratch uh, within five different languages. Thank you. The major introduction to Python, Scratch, introduction to JavaScript, all of these content is in Hindi and English, but C4CA content is in five languages. Thank you, thank you. Um, so last thing I will just quickly talk about what the third thing that we are doing is called Samyarth. It is a tech cooperative that we are building. Um, very fundamentally, if you buy an Amul chocolate, 80% of the proceeds go to a farmer. And if you buy a dairy milk chocolate, 10% of the proceeds go to the farmer who is um, doing cocoa farming or um, dairy farmers. Um, how do we bring that philosophy in the tech services cooperative as well? So we're building a cooperative of sorts where uh, the economic distribution of profits that come from projects, products, and services that we do will be more equitably distributed to the developers um, as well rather than just to its shareholders. And most of these developers will come from marginalized, underserved communities in order to ensure that economic distribution happens distribute, uh, equitably. Our goal is to reach 25,000 people from underserved communities as a part uh, of mainstream tech industry by 2030. We will take up projects and products to do this, and as much of it, if it's not proprietary from a customer point of view, we'll keep it open source. One key new thing that we are also doing is something called UTAS, which is called Underserved Talent as a Service, which will allow big MNCs to hire people on a, if they want to hire contract basis, but without changing too many policies and uh, remove barriers of hiring. Right now, for example, NatWest has hired three, since last three years, they've been hiring from Navgurukul. But that has happened because there's a champion within NatWest, which is ex-Royal Bank of Scotland. It's a 30,000 um, big uh, team within, development team within India. And they've, they've hired from us consistently because there's a champion within NetWest who has gotten policy changes. NetWest used to hire just from IITs. They let go of IITs to BTEC, to BCOM, to BCA, to any degree at all, to 12th standard, to 10th standard. And that's, that's the amount of policy changes they've done in order to be able to hire people from Navgurukul. But with NetWest, with this UTAS model, we are changing that. So I'll, this is our team, and people can reach out. If anybody wants to use Miraki in any context that they are aware of, uh, please reach out if anybody wants to hire JavaScript, Python developers, developers who are trained in DSA at entry level, please reach out. If anybody wants to understand how we do the team and learning aspect of it, we can speak to that as well. Thank you.